Chapter five, World versus Virus. Spanish Influenza Pandemic, 1918 to 1919. Over there, over there, send the world, send the world over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming and we won't come back till it's over, over there. More than 20 soldiers all singing at the top of their lungs made the popular song echo down the long barracks buildings, ending with a shout on the last two words, over there, that practically sent the windows rattling in their frames. Albert Glitch had, had ached. He pulled his thin blanket over his head and burrowed down in the bunks, trying to block out the noise and get some sleep. In these gigantic, I'm sorry, giant drafty barracks, hastily built only months before the to house American soldiers on their way to Europe to fight World War I. There was no escaping the rowdy song and laughter that sometimes seemed to go on all night. There was a good reason to stay up singing. It was the only way to stay warm through the frigid Kansas night. Huddled around the glowing stove, clapping hands, stomping feet, sharing cigarettes, the men tried to keep the cold at bay. Normally, Albert would be in the thick of the fun, giving the renditions of the popular tune as loudly as he could. But tonight, he longed for quiet. More than anything, he wanted to go to sleep and wake up feeling less achy and feverish than he felt right now. In the winter of 1917 to 1918 was the coldest on record in the state of Kansas. The officers who would normally order the soldiers to bed looked the other way and let the men at the camp Fun stun, sing through the freezing nights. It was the only way the camp medical staff who got angry when they found clumps of men knotted around the stove for warmth. Then they would lecture the soldiers about the dangers of spreading contamination. No one paid them any attention. The men needed to keep warm. And if that meant they might spread germs to one another, it was a risk they were prepared to take. And after all, what was the worst that could happen? A couple of days in the infirmary, infirmary? One of the camp's superior officers had already complained to the army administration about the conditions at Camp Funston, writing that the barracks were tense, were overcrowded and inadequately heated, and it was impossible to supply the men with sufficient warm clothing. The conditions at the camp were perfect for spreading diseases, but nothing was done. Not quite a year later, on April 6, 1917, the United States had declared war against Germany, joining the Allied nations among them, England, France, Canada, Australia, and Russia in the Great War, which we now know as World War I. But the country had only a small army and they would need many more men to join the war efforts. Within a few months, the army had drafted 2.8 million men. A massive camps were hastily erected all over the country to train the new soldiers before they were shipped overseas from the front lines of Europe. Camp Funston was one of the biggest training camps, but even so, it was crowded. Located in Kansas, it had endless lines of tents and low wooden barracks where 26,000 brand new soldiers slept and ate and washed together in space designed for far fewer men. Most soldiers didn't stay long in Camp Funston. They were soon sent off for more training at other camps or onto ships carrying them to the battlegrounds of Europe. The plan was that they, by the summer of 1918, the US would be sending 10,000 soldiers to France every day. And although neither the men singing around the store nor poor Albert Glitch knew it, the United States would very soon be sending some invisible cargo to Europe along with the soldiers, a deadly virus. The wards fill up. Albert woke up early. As an army cook, he was trained to wake up in the pre-dawn hours, log long before the revealing sounds to report for duty, for breakfast duty. He dragged himself out of his bunk and dressed in his uniform, even though his body screamed in protest and his head throbbed. He made his way slowly across the frigid camps 
to the kitchen. By the time he arrived, the fires had already been lit. He slipped an apron over his head and took his place quietly in the line of cooks, hoping to avoid his sergeant's eyes. An enormous pot of porridge stood in front of him on the range, and he picked up the metal spoon and stirred the mess and kept it from burning on the bottom. Nothing made the men complain more loudly than burnt porridge in the morning. That had been one of the first lessons in the army. Clang, the spoon, the spoon slipped through his fingers and clattered noisily onto the rough wooden floorboards. Wearily, Albert bent down to retrieve it, then turned back to the vat on the stove. Private glitch, stop what you're doing right now. Albert froze, the spoon, the spoon in the air above the porridge. It was the sergeant. Glitch, have you or have you not been instructed on the basics of kitchen hygiene? I have, sir, Albert said. Then you know better than to use a dirty spoon from the floor. That's the fastest way to get the health officers in here. Glitch, and we don't want them looking over our so so shoulders. As he spoke, the sergeant strode across the kitchen until he stood next to Albert. He noticed the young soldier was pale, his eyes glazed, beads of sweat dotting his sword. You feel okay, Glitch? Little, under the weather this morning, I guess. Didn't sleep too good, Albert replied dully. The sergeant sighed with irritation. Hygiene again, Glitch. Kitchen staff are not to report for duty when sick. Take off that apron and get yourself to the hospital camp. By the time he had crossed the camp to the hospital, Albert was feeling worse, much worse. The medical staff officer didn't need to do much more than glance at him before he diagnosed. Flu, report to the contagious ward. You are confined to bed, soldier. Albert was barely out the door when another man staggered into the hospital. It was Corporal Lee W. Drake of the 1st Baltons Transportation Detachment, complaining of a headache, fever, sore throat, and achy joints. Symptoms were identical to Albert. He was sent to join Albert in the contagious ward. So Sergeant Aldolf Rudolph, right behind Drake, also suffered the, from flu symptoms. Another man followed, then another. The medical officer picked up the phone to alert the camp's doctor about the sudden rash of influenza cases. When the doctor arrived, he was staggered to see a line of sick men that stretched out the infirmary doors and across the hospital grounds. That evening, poor Albert was kept awake by noise again, not routing singing, but coughing and moaning from more than 100 fellow sufferers crowded into the contagious ward of the hospital with him. By the end of the week, there were 500 soldiers confined to bed with influenza at camp, fun stuck. Private Glitch, patient zero. Private Glitch, Army Cook, became the first recorded patient in the great influenza pandemic that over the next year would kill between 50 and 100 million people around the globe. Albert survived his bout of the flu, but he was one of the lucky ones. At Camp Funston, 48 of his fellow soldiers died from influenza that month as the great movement of US troops began. Sick men from Funston spread the disease to other camps. In March of 1918, 84,000 camp soldiers set sail for the port of Brest in France. In April, 118,000 more boarded troop ships for the journey to the front lines. Influenza spread fast in the crowded ships and hundreds of men had to be carried off when they landed in France. Thousands more were still walking about extremely infectious. The Allied soldiers arrived in Europe. British, French, Canadian, and Russian troops were in weak condition after four years spent in the trenches. Among these men, the influenza virus spread like wildflowers. Tens of thousands of soldiers began filling an army infirmary in the late spring of 1918, too sick to report for duty. And while most were up and around again in a few days, the sheer number of sick men affected military operation. The British Navy had to delay launching its fleet for three days that June because there weren't enough healthy soldiers available 
to man, man the ships. Soon the virus crossed the no man's land between the trenches and began spreading among the German troops. For months, Germany had been playing, planning a massive offense in the spring of 1918, but tens of thousands of sick soldiers that operation had to be canceled. Many historians now believe that if influenza hadn't prevented Germany from launching its offense, Germany might have won the war. Still, nobody outside the army knew that one of the biggest epidemics in human history was underway. Almost every country had a wartime citizen, a wartime censorship law that put restrictions on what newspapers and radio stations could report. Printing or broadcasting any news that could hurt the war efforts or damage public morale, making people worry that their own country wasn't going, going to win the war was forbidden. So letting people know that hundreds of thousands of soldiers were sick was definitely off limits. That meant members of the public didn't take precautions that might have kept them from catching the disease, like staying away from crowds. Instead, people were encouraged to attend rallies and parades and support the troops. The disease spread fast among the civilian population in Europe. Even the King of Spain came down with the influenza. Spain, unlike most, almost every other country in Europe, wasn't involved in the war. It was officially neutral. So the newspapers were free to print all the news. That spring, the big news in Spain was the influenza epidemic. Other countries unable to report on their own epidemic reprinted the article about the outbreak in Spain. And so the disease that spread across the world became known as the Spanish influenza. Calling in the scientists. Soon the influenza was out of control, causing chaos and death around the world. And there didn't seem to be anything doctors could do to stop the spread of the disease or to help the victims. U.S. Surgeon General Victor Vaughn commented bitterly that the doctors of the day knew more about the flu than 14th century Flor Floridians had, Florentines had known about the Black Death. It was a big setback until the Spanish flu came along. Medical science had been making steady progress in the fight against disease. Cholera, typhoid, yellow fever, malaria, many of the terrifying diseases of the past could now be effectively treated. Then suddenly the new deadly spread of the influenza appeared and began decimating populations worldwide. It was ha happening with such lightning speed that there was almost no time for scientific community to come up with solutions. No time to develop vaccines, no time to organize a worldwide public health response. In the US, one team of scientists was working hard to analyze the spread of the disease. On April 18, 1918, the head of the public service, the public health service sent a letter to Dr. Wade Hampton Forrest asking him to take charge of the newly formed Office of Field Investigation of Influenza. It was a grand title for a small operation. With very little funding, Wake, Wade Forrest had previously investigated typhoid outbreaks along the Ohio River and polio epidemics in New York. He was one of the most respected American scientists in the field of epidemiology. Go back to page 94, purple box, a virus that gets around. Spanish influenza moved so fast in 1918 that some people thought the disease was the German army's secret weapon or that the disease was released in the clouds of poisonous gas on the battlefield. We now know that the influenza is spread from person to person through infection droplets in the air. People with influenza shed the virus for three to six days after being infected, often before they have developed any symptoms. And the virus is tough. It can survive on a hard surface like a doorknob for up to two days, waiting for a hand to help to make the leap to the mouth or eye or a nose. 
Influenza is a crowd disease spreading easily when people are packed together like soldiers on a troop ship or in the trenches of World War I. Malnutrition, exhaustion, and lack of medicine, medical care increased the risk. So many soldiers came down with the flu in 1918. It brought an early end to the war. Turn to page 96. At the top, blue box. It wasn't just the flu. Doctors had never seen anything quite like Spanish influenza. Some of the first major outbreaks happened at military camps near Boston in the early fall of 1918. In a letter to a friend, one camp doctor describes the horrors he was witnessing. Two hours after administra administration, they had the mahogany spots over the chest cheekbones. And a few hours later, you can begin to see the cytosis, a condition in which the skin turns blue from lacks of oxygen. Extended through the ears and spreading all over the face it was only a matter of hours then until death came. And it is a struggle for air until they suffocate. It is horrible. We have been averaging about 100 deaths a day and still keeping it up. It takes special trains to carry away the dead bodies. For several days, there were no coffins and the bodies piled up something fierce. We used to go down to the morgue and look at the boys laid out in long rows. It beat any sight they had ever had in France after a battle. <laughs>